Let's take a look at the scriptures up here on the screen today. Because uh, I want to kind of take a look at a couple of different things here. Let's take a look at this one right here. This is Joshua 1.8, old book of the Bible. And you need to remember, Joshua is a very important character in the Old Testament. The fact that Moses, I love the first verse of Moses, of Joshua chapter 1, it says, Now Moses, the servant of God, is dead. That's all he got. Forty years of running around with a bunch of murmuring Jews. Can you imagine? Like having a house full of kids, house full of cats for 40 years, and that's all he got. The highest compliment that God could give any of us is the fact that he would call us his servant. And so he tells Joshua, he says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate in it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Everybody say careful to do everything. Careful to do everything. How many of you are doing it all? Well, hopefully we'll do some more of it, okay? Okay. Because when we do, look at the promise of God right after that. Then, after you keep all of that, then who's going to make your way prosperous? Is God going to do it? No, the Bible says you're going to do that. Why? Because when you have all the keys of the kingdom and you have unlocked all of the promises of God, everything you do is going to prosper and be successful. But it's all up to you. You know, I wish we could put our little heads on the pillow and underneath it our Bible or our, our phones with our scripture apps on it <laughs> and we can sleep on it and wake up in the morning and be smarter, but that's not the point. The Bible says the word meditate. That means to mentally chew over and over and over again. Go over it, go over it, go over it until it becomes a part of you. Keep this book of the law. And I think it's real interesting. People say, well, oh, I'm, I'm a New Testament guy. Well, you know, when the New Testament written was written, there wasn't anything but the Old Testament. There wasn't anything. Jesus didn't pull out his New Testament when he was here on earth. He pulled out the scripture, the Old Testament. It's the whole thing. He's the completion of that. Take a look here at this scripture here. Job, Old Testament again. For they, God's people, obey and serve him. And when they do, if they do, They'll spend the rest of their life, all their days in prosperity and years of contentment. Years of contentment. That's when we obey what God has for us to do. So let's take a look at another one. This is 2 John, 3 John 2. I love this one. Beloved, this is the person that was closest to Jesus while here on earth. This is the person that when Jesus would lean up against the tree, I love the imagery, Jesus would lean up against the tree, John would put his head on Jesus' chest. And Jesus would speak to him. There was no person on earth that was closer to him than John. And here's what John says. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, K. Just as your soul prospers. That means this has got to prosper. you got to do that by spending time in God's word. That's the way it happens. That's the way it happens. But God wants you to prosper and be in health. You know, I want to live a long time, but I want to live a long time well. I want to live a long time well. So let's pray this morning. Let's thank God, you know what, that these scriptures are true for us today. God wants you well. God wants you to prosper. God wants you to be in health, even as you prosper. So let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have this opportunity to come before you this morning to worship you here today. And Father, we thank you that you love us with an undying love. You have made a way for us to spend eternity in heaven with you. So Heavenly Father, this morning, it's with great privilege and honor that we come before you to worship you now in our giving. Because Father, you have prospered us. You have blessed us. We have been blessed coming in and going out and everything that we put our hands to do is blessed. So Father, it's easy to come to worship you this morning with our giving. So Heavenly Father, you speak to our hearts this morning. You speak to our hearts as to how much we should give this morning. How much have you prospered us this week? How much have you blessed our businesses? How much have you kept us safe? Father, we bless you this morning with our giving. 
and we do it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. And we give by a little simple giving app. If you want to take a picture of the QRL there, that's an easy way to do it. it takes you right to the Givelify app. I like it. The fact that it gives, did everybody, you should have gotten a, a notice from the end of the year about your tax giving because it should send it out to you. And if you don't, you can go right on there if you've not already done your taxes. And I sent you one out. Hopefully they, they corresponded well. If not, let me know. But that's the way that we always take care of the accounting on all of your giving for the year for your taxes as well. They send all that out. But I'm thankful that everybody's here today. I'm glad that Robert and Brian made it back from Germany. And where all, where all did you go? Italy. You went with family, didn't you? Did, did you make sure they had a good time? Oh, good. Well, <laughs> I know people don't want to go on vacation with me because we were going from like 7 o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night. We like, I'm, we're going to see it all while we're there. Whether you want to or not, I will drag you. We will go. Now, for the last couple of weeks, eight weeks to be exact, <coughs> we've been talking about rethinking your life. <coughs> Rethinking your thinking. Some of us have had some bad thinking. <coughs> Excuse me. You've, you've had bad training. You've had bad teaching. Some of you have had wrong ideas. And that's the problem, especially with our community and the fact that they have not always heard the truth of God's word. They've heard people who have used the word of God to diminish other people and society groups and things like that around the world. They've done it for years. This is not new. It's not new. We should be used to it by now. But with all of that, with all of that, <coughs> what we have had is we've had a lot of mental abuse and mental pain and suffering. So what I want to do today is I want to think about changing how you think about pain. How many have ever had pain before? If you haven't, I want to know your secret, okay? Because every one of us have endured some kind of pain. Every one of us have. And Paul uses the word, well, the Greek, not just Paul, but the, the Greek word metanoia is the word how we change our thinking. Change our thinking. You know, the word in the Bible that they use for that is the word repent. We've also, all, you know, most people have heard that repentance is a bad thing. You know, you need to repent. They throw that word around. No, it simply means to change your thinking. Change your thinking from the way you're thinking to the way God thinks. So this morning, I want us to think about pain the way God thinks about it. I want us to think about pain the way God sees it. Because I tell you, pain is not something you really want to endure a lot of. And you want to make sure that you're doing something with it when you have it. Pain is not something you want without a result, without something good coming about. So I want us to take a look at what Solomon had to say. Solomon is the daughter, the son rather, of, of David and Bathsheba. He's the miracle that came as a result of that. He makes this statement in Ecclesiastes. He says, so what do people get for all of their hard work and struggles here on earth? What do you think we should get? I mean, I've worked a long time. I've worked a minimum of two jobs my, almost my entire life, except for the last three years. So I was telling Missy this morning, it was four years ago this week that I had finished speaking. Many of those of you who are new don't know that I've had a lifelong career of public speaking. And I was speaking in, in New Orleans four years ago today. And it was interesting that they, that was when they had announced that New Orleans was the super spreader because of all of the Mardi Gras and things like that. And that was the last week that I spoke professionally outside of church. And it's just interesting. And I said, so what do people get for all of their hard work and their struggles in life? What do you think Solomon would make us, give us this understanding? He says this right here. Their entire life is filled with pain. That's what you get for a long life of work. For their life, for their work is unbearable. Even at night, their minds don't rest. It all seems so pointless. I think it's pretty sad. But when you take a look at the pain that he's talking about here, it will change your mind. It will change your mind. You know, to me, this is a very relevant text. I'll tell you about it. Their entire life is filled with pain and their work is unbearable. Well, what I will tell you about pain, and we'll talk about it today, scientific studies have documented that human beings are able to handle enormous amounts of pain if, everybody say if, if 
we know there's a good purpose for that pain, if there's a good purpose for that pain. I know we have three moms here who've had kids, Linda and Debbie and Kay. Was there some pain involved? Was, I mean, sitting next to him, was there any pain involved? A little, little? Now, I was present for each of my four daughters' births. I was there. I can tell you that wasn't <laughs> a walk in the park. One of, one of my kids, they didn't think that Joan was in labor, so they gave her a sleeping pill so she could go home and get some rest. That sleeping pill, all it did was make her groggy and grout, and she was, they thought it was Braxton Hicks, false labor. Take this pill, go home, get some rest, and then we'll see you in a few days. They never stopped. We were back at the hospital about four hours later, and she was having contractions before she couldn't handle them because they'd given her this drug to make her sleep. And I, I remember she was just about ready to throw anybody, including me, around the room. There was so much pain going on. And I looked at her and I said, it's going to be over in a little bit. <laughs> in a little bit. <laughs> That's exactly the case. She wanted to slap me upside the head. It was like when Melody, uh, those of you that have ever been to Six Flags, uh, when Flashback came out, Melody was riding in the car with me. Joan was in with Abigail and Spice and Charity were in, uh, in one of the little cars together. And we had gone through all of these loops and hoops and things like that and stops right halfway through, and Melody's just screaming, I want off, I want off, I want off, and I said, we'll be off in about 30 seconds, as we went back, went back the whole thing. The whole point is, is that when you're in the middle of that pain, you want out of it. You want out. Promise you. That's the reason why they have the husbands there, to coach, to coach them, breathe, breathe. <laughs> I remember all the lessons, all the classes that we went to, and all the work that we did for no reason, because it just, you know, Joan was saying, I want an epidural. I said, it's too late now. We're going through this. The pain is incredible. But afterwards, when you're holding that baby, and you're looking into their eyes, and they're so fresh, and they're fragile, and they're helpless, that mom begins to forget that pain. Now, my mom reminded me of that pain almost every day of my life. <laughs> almost every day. You realize how I, 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 I get it. I get it. But what are you doing with the pain? What are you doing? How are you harvesting a crop of good things out of that? Now, we look at the children that were coming as a result of that birth, but you know what? It's important to remind ourselves that, that that pain has a result, has a result. Paul makes this statement over here in Romans. He says, we know, everybody say we know. We know it. We know in all things God works for the good of those who what? Who love him. Now, I've seen a lot of people go through a lot of tragedy in their life, and they didn't love God, and that tragedy was painful, and there was no good result out of it. But God promises us good results out of every pain in our life as long as we remember his purpose. That's the thing. We know in all things God works for the good of those. It doesn't say all things are good. It does not say all things are good. It just says that he's going to work for our good in all things, no matter what they are. And here's the reason why. Who have been called according to his purpose purpose, his purpose. We know his purpose. His purpose is to bring us to him. That's his purpose. He wants us to spend eternity with him. He loves us. He loves us. He loves us. Our community needs to hear that more than anything else. He loves us. Our Heavenly Father loves us, regardless of what anybody else says. You can't take away what the Bible says. You should let the Bible speak for itself. God works for the good of all of those according to his purpose. His purpose. There are a lot of bad things going on. I've traveled the world. I've been in 56 foreign countries, and I can tell you that in a lot of those countries, I've seen a lot of bad, 
I'm sure Keith has seen, we all travel a lot. You've seen a lot of bad. There's a lot of bad in the world. There's a lot of bad. I've seen people starving. I've seen people off the side of the road begging. And you know they can't rub two nickels together because they just are in poverty. There's a lot of bad. And I will tell you something that you're not going to want to like. God will use pain. He doesn't cause it. But God will use that pain to help us understand who he is and how much he loves us. Because he's going to turn the pain around for our good. You don't see it when you're in the middle of it. I can guarantee you, <laughs> Joan didn't see any good out of anything going on in labor and delivery. Saw nothing good going on. But I guarantee you now, all of those daughters are things that she's proud of more than anything else. Sadly, most people waste their suffering. People don't know that you're supposed to be getting something out of that while you're going through it. People only are like, you know, what we're seeing with the new Hubble and the Webb telescope. We're seeing all these black holes. Things so powerful that they're pulling and bending light rays even in towards themselves. Light can't even get out. There are so many people in the world like that that see the pain as something that they're going through that they can't see any good thing coming out of it. And as a pastor, that's one of the things that I've had to do my entire career is to help people see that, you know what, there is something good. Something good can come out of this, but you have to determine that you're going to see it. Most people won't. They don't know how to profit from their problems. And they don't know how to harvest from their hurt. They don't. So I'm telling you today that you've got to turn the way things turn against you. You see them, and our community sees them as God doing this to them. This is God doing this to them. This is because of who you are. And that's not the way it works. It's not the way it works. But that's why we have to know God's word even more than that. You see, the hard thing is, if you've gone through all these problems and you've not gotten anything good out of it, that's why Paul comes up and says this over in Galatians. He says, have you gone through all of this for nothing? Have you endured all of this pain for nothing? Is it really for nothing? You've got to determine that pain is going to be something, you know, we're all going to have it. Whether you're 5, 50, or going on 75 like some of us. I will tell you, you will have pain the rest of your life. Whether it be physical, emotional, relational, or financial, you're going to have pain. It's going to happen. You're going to have disappointments, and that's going to hurt. You're going to lose something, and that's going to hurt. Devastation will happen because we live in a world that is broken. But what I will tell you is we have a choice of making something come out of it that turns out for our good because that's what God wants for us. You're not going to like it, but you're going to have pain the rest of your life. But what I do want to share with you today is five things that can come as a result of pain. And this is the thing we want. We want the results to be good from pain. We don't want the bad stuff. So the first thing is we want to use pain to draw closer to God and to trust Him more. I'll tell you something. It's been 15 years ago. I didn't say anything about this a couple of weeks ago. I was going through probably one of the worst times in my whole life in the last 20 years. Anybody know that? No, because I was trying to figure out for God, from God why I was going through something. About 15 years ago, uh, Keith was here. Uh, a lot of the church probably didn't understand why I came to church one Sunday in a, in a blue leisure suit, tra track suit. Because what had happened was, I was in, uh, long story short, don't need to make it long, I found out that I had a, a lump in my groin. Turned out to be melanoma. It metastasized, and they did surgery on me. I thought I was going to have a little incision. It turned out to be 13 inches. I woke up, had tubes coming out of my belly, vacuum tubes on each side, and I couldn't hide them. 
that was on a Tuesday. My second oldest daughter was getting married on that Friday in Vegas. I was going to have to fly to Vegas and, excuse me, my former wife is the drama person in our family. You think I am it? She's the drama personified. And everything that has ever happened to her, from a broken fingernail to a hurt toe, has taken over everything that we have ever done in our life. So the last thing I wanted to do was to make a big deal out of this going on, even though it could have been a big deal. So I went to that wedding, and nobody even knew that I'd had surgery. Nobody knew what was happening, because I'd worn a jacket that was too big, and I had these vacuum bulbs coming out from the sides of me, because I had tubes coming out of my leg. Three weeks ago now, I woke up. And we all take showers. This is not a big deal. We all wash our body. And I found another lump in my right. They'd already taken out. Cut me 13 inches from my side all the way down my leg. Took out every lymph gland in my left leg. Now, they told me this was to save my life. So you know what? The pain was going to be worth it. I was, every day, I mean, they had... Out of my navel, they had stitched these two bulbs to my skin. So every time I walked, every time I put on pants, every time I took a shower, these bulbs were pulling stitches in my gut every, every moment of the day for eight weeks. So I know a little bit about pain. But what I will tell you is, two weeks ago, that same fear hit me. I went to see my doctor, and I said, this is exactly the same thing. And he assured me that it wasn't. But I will tell you, between the Monday that I made the appointment and the Thursday was the first day he could see me, I will tell you, I didn't sleep very much. But I will tell you something. The pain that I endured reminded me that the only thing that could keep me from that was to get closer and closer and closer to God. Closer, closer. So you got to use the pain, whether it's real, remembered, or happening. You got to remember that. Paul makes this statement: he says, "We're crushed, overwhelmed, and saw how powerless we were to help ourselves." That's how I felt. I'm going like God. I will do this again. I don't want to do it. I don't want to go through that pain again. He says we don't know how to help ourselves, but that was good. For then, we put everything into the hands of God who alone can save us, and he did help us. Sometimes, pain is a good thing to remind you who you belong to and who wants to help you. Problem is, we don't always do that. We don't always remind ourselves. We'll get a little... We get, we get going, and things go really good. Sixes and sevens, everything's happening well, and everything's going well. And we forget that, you know what? We live in a broken world, and the enemy is just trying to pull the carpet out from under you. Trying. Look over here in 2 Corinthians 7. Paul says, I'm glad, not because it, your troubles, I put that in there. I'm glad, not because it hurt you, but because the pain turned you to God. How many of you have ever been in pain? He says, God, just take this pain away. Just take it away. I mean, it may not have been physical pain. It may not have been emotional pain. Just take this hurt away. Because we cry out to God. Another reason, you know, these are five purposes of pain right here. Second one is here. It's coming up. Use pain to draw closer to others in fellowship. You know what? You need to remind yourself that other people sometimes are going through the same pain you've gone through. Yeah. It's good. It's good. I've gone down to people, I've seen people, uh, I remember when the doctor made an appointment for me after a bad report came back and took me, walked me, my doctor walked me in Presbyterian Hospital from his office over to Texas Oncology in another building in, in Presbyterian over on, on Walnut Hill made me an appointment. And I sat down in there, and I thought I didn't feel any different before they did the surgery till afterwards. And you know what? I'm looking around, and these people are sick. They're sick. 
they've got that grayish, greenish kind of look through their skin. You know that they're not well. And you're sitting there and you feel good. You feel good. And you're going, thank God. Thank God. It draws you closer. If it doesn't, there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong. Galatians, Paul says it here. He says, by helping each other with your troubles, with your troubles, you truly obey the law of Christ. When you've got a situation going on and you feel like it's going on in somebody else, you know what? It feels good to go and talk to them. It feels good to have somebody you can pray for and with about what's going on. You know what? They may not have anybody, but you hear about it and you want to go help them. You want to go help them. You want to go help them. Another reason to call it is to use pain to grow deeper in your relationship with Jesus. Proverbs 20 says, oops, sorry. Proverbs 20 says this. Sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. We don't, we don't change because we see the light. We change because of the pain or the fire. We don't think when things are going good, uh, why should I change? But boy, when the pain begins or the fire turns up, then we have the tendency to want to make a change. Over here in Hebrews, Paul makes this statement. It says, even so even though Jesus was God's son, even though he was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Pain is a good thing. I don't want it, but I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to learn that God has a reason for that and not walk away and not come out of anything other than the, I've got bad memories of pain. Look over here in, in verse 9. He says, suffering made Jesus perfect, and now he can save forever. He can save forever all who obey him. Paul turns around in Corinthians 6, 7. He says, now, isn't it wonderful all the ways in which this distress has goaded you closer to God? Now, isn't it? You're more alive. You're more concerned. You're more sensitive, more reverent, more human, more passionate, more responsible. When you come through something, you come through with a different perspective. I can be dead now. That's a perspective. Why am I still here? Because I've got a reason. I've got a purpose. These five things we're talking about are the purpose that you come out of having had pain, some hurt on the inside. He goes on to say, you look at it from any angle, you come out of this with purity of heart. The reason why is you're, you're conscious, you're breathing, you're alive. You understand that God has got you and he wants to purify that perfect heart of yours. He wants you to be closer. He wants you to be deeper, closer to him. You know, we talked about Paul's testimony several times. Um, it's kind of small, but I'm going to read it to you. It starts over here. It says, I've worked much harder. This is Paul. He says, I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in an open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from the rivers, in danger from the bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger of false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressures of my concern for all the churches. Well, how many churches? He started over 250 churches himself. He had a lot going on. All of the pain, all that he suffered. He comes back and he makes this statement in 2 Corinthians. He says, for this reason, all of that, 
we never become discouraged. I know people. I've pastored since 1981 in this city. I've had people. You know, it's raining outside. I'm not going to go to church. It's a little cold. A little hot. I have to park on that parking lot. We got one that you can park under. They know that. It's nice to park in a nice place when your car doesn't get rained on or dirty or hot or cold. I've had people come because, oh, it's a, you know, it's a little cloudy out. Oh, it's going to be a good day. Let's do this. You know, people will do just about anything, just about anything to keep from growing with God, having a responsible life with Him. And then pain comes and they don't know what to do about it. They don't know how to handle it. I know kids that have grown up in Sunday school, went to church their whole life, you know? And I, I, I think about two out of four of mine. I think about two out of four of mine. I mean, all of my kids, thank God, thank God, they've all got great jobs. Three of them have got great husbands, great families. One of them is, will be single, I guess, for the rest of her life, and that's okay. I want whatever makes you happy. Two of them very involved in church, two of them not involved in church. But they all know church. They all know. They all have a relationship. Not what I would want for them, but it's what they have. But I've watched how each one of them have navigated through very painful situations, and they all come back to that. And I'm reminded, it says, you know, train up a child when they're young, and when they're old... They won't depart from it. They all come back to it. When we have pain, when we have devastation come from seemingly nowhere, blindsided by something that just tears us apart, for this reason, for this reason, we never become discouraged. Even though our physical being is gradually decaying, yet our spiritual being is renewed day after day. While all of our bodies is just weakening, our spiritual side is strengthening, and these temporary troubles, <laughs> all of that, temporary, he's looking at all that day after day after day after day. He was chained between guards the majority of the time when he was in prison. And he was dictating to Timothy the books of the Testament that we read today, Timothy was scribing them down. And the thing that I think is amazing is he, instead of looking at it like, I'm in jail, I'm held captive in the worst place of all, keeping me from going out and doing what I'm supposed to do, he recognized that I've got a captive audience. And every day, these guards are changing, and every day I'm talking about the power and the miracles of God. And I may have, he had his feet broken. When it talks about these, these being whipped, his feet were put into shackles. Beaten with rods means that every bone in his feet were broken. And yet he would get up and go travel somewhere, hobbling along. Where's Paul? Can't stop Paul. He's like an ever-ready battery. He will not stop. For this reason, we never become the curse. Why? Because he realized that as he spoke in all of that, people listened. Because he said, he goes on to say, and here's the reason. He says, much greater than the, back it up, Look, let's read it. And these temporary troubles we suffer will bring us a tremendous and eternal glory, much greater than the trouble. What I see coming is much more powerful than what I've been through or what I've endured. For we fix our attention not on things that are seen, but on things which are unseen. What can be seen lasts only for a time, only for a moment, but what we cannot see lasts forever. He had an understanding of what's coming is more powerful and more lasting than any moment of pain, no matter how long it might last. As my mother reminded me, 26 hours of hard labor.
He said, this life is but a flash, just a moment. Just a moment. Now, isn't it wonderful? It's powerful. Look here. We should use pain to be more sensitive in serving other people. I'll tell you, go to the hospital. Go visit some folks. Go to a nursing home. Walk down those aisles. You'll, you'll see what warehousing is all about. It's all about people taking advantage of old people who have no family, who are lonely, who are hurting. You should walk down those aisles. Pray for those people. I'll give you an understanding about empathy, no matter how old or young you might be. But Paul says over here in 2 Corinthians, he says, God comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. Then, when others are troubled, we'll be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. Why? Because we know God. Other people don't. If they do, they may not know him quite like we know him. You can be sure that the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ so that when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your benefit and salvation. Why? Because we have more to talk about. We have more to talk about how God got me through this, how God got me through that. I'm walking today with a left leg. You know that? And there were times in my life that I didn't know that I would. There are times. Keith and I have a nose. We have a nose. Still looks pretty good. A few years ago, while during the pandemic, Keith and I both lost our noses. Why? Because they cut them off. Because they found cancer on my nose. Why? You just keep going. You don't stop. But what do you do with the pain that you have to endure? You have to make a harvest. You have to see that there's something worthwhile. Your impact and your testimony to other people, no matter how painful it may be, other people are going through that same scenario right now, whether you know it or not. Fifth thing. Use pain to witness to other people. You know, I, I have an opportunity a lot. I used to more than I do now when I was out, out in the public all the time. Of course, I couldn't talk about my relationship to God or that I was a pastor when I was in front of all these big crowds, but people would come up to me, and I've told you about it. Because I would say, you know, blessings for God are always there for me. And I, people come up and say, well, are you a Christian? And they say, I bet you're a Christian. I say, yeah. It gives you an opportunity, but when you were, I remember when sitting in that oncology office, I witnessed to that Christy McIntyre, Dr. Christy McIntyre, who's at Texas Oncology up here at Presby. When I walked in, you know, my doctor said, you're, you're, a, you're a four out of a five. And I said, oh, what does that mean? He said, well, it's not good. And Dr. McIntyre looked at me and said, you know, we're going to go ahead and make your annual exam. And I said, well, sure, I'm going to be here next year. And she looked at me and said, yeah. I said, I said, no, I'm going to be here next year. I said, I'm going to be here to see all of my daughters. This was a long time ago. This was the first time they diagnosed me. I said, I'm going to see all of my daughters graduate from high school. I'm going to see them all graduate from college. And I'm going to see them all walk. And I'm going to walk them all down the aisle who all wants to walk down the aisle. I plan on seeing my grandkids. She looked at me and said, I understand that PMA. And I said, no, it's not positive mental attitude. It's not that. I said, I have a knowledge that goes beyond that. I have a knowledge that God is my healer. And if he's not, then I trust him enough that I'm going to have a better place. And I remember the next year, I was sitting on that little table, that little crinkly white paper we all sit on, you know. And I'm, and I'm watching her pace looking in my room, looking at my chart. She's really looking in my room, looking at my chart. She come in. She finally came in. I said, well, how are you, Dr. McIntyre? She says, I frankly didn't think I'd see you this year. I said, why? Are you going to be out of town? I said, I told you I'd be here. And for five years, I remember the third year that I came in, she was punching my stomach like all punch, 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 punch.
punch, 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 punch. Does that hurt? No. Does that hurt? No. Does that hurt? No, 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 no. no. Trying to convince me <laughs> that it should hurt. I said, I said, Dr. McIntyre, I have told you year after year, I plan on having you check me out and sign me off. Which after five years she did. You see, you have an ability, no matter how bad that hurts, to let other people know that, you know what? Out of all of this, God's going to get the glory somewhere, somehow. Philippians, Paul makes this statement. He says right here, Paul's in prison when he says this, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. When he was chained up, Every one of those guards heard the gospel every time. Every time. He's preaching the gospel. He's chained up. He's bound. He is in jail. And Timothy is riding away. I've not been stopped. The gospel hasn't been stopped because of this. It's expanded. Look over here in 2 Corinthians. He says, in everything we do, we try to show. Everything we do, we should be showing it that we are true servants of God. We patiently endure suffering and hardship and trouble of every kind. Patient. You know what? It's going to be over. We might think, this is so long. Man, I remember six weeks changing the gauze, pulling the gauze out of my leg, these tubes in my leg. I, I, I thought, will this ever end? Is he ever going to release me? Is he going to say, it's going to close up by itself? Okay been a long time six weeks on this earth is a long time it's that in the forever i mean it's it's year I mean, that's thousands of years ago now we have a knowledge that god because of his infinite love for us wants to help direct our paths to the future, not this moment. The pain that lasts this moment is for only a second. So, I got some homework for you. Don't waste your pain. When something happens and it's devastating, devastating, I want you to get alone this sometime this week. And I want you to write down the four most painful moments in your life. Just get alone. Take a little three by five index card. Just write them out. Put them on notes on your on your phone. The four things. Then I want you to find and think about four people who are going through those same four things. and invite them next Sunday because we're going to find out what to do with resilience and getting back from all that pain. So that's my message next Sunday, resilience, recovering from trauma and pain. And I promise you it will change people's lives. Think about it. Do you know somebody that's going through the same kind of pain that you're going through? They don't have to. They don't have to. We serve a God that loves his kids eternally and has made a way for us to spend that eternity with him. And his name is Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, this morning we're so thankful that we have a God that is our healer. He heals every part of us, our mind, body, soul, our emotions, our finances, he heals every part of our life. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful. So thankful that we don't worship a dead God that can't move even a mouse. But we serve a God that will move heaven and earth to show us how much he loves us. So Heavenly Father, this morning we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for sending him here to walk as a human being, to suffer and understand what pain is all about and how much you loved us when you sent him here. So that we know that we have a survival after this. 
we have a tomorrow. We can rejoice in that, that these days are few, few, few compared to the eternity that we'll spend with you. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning and we thank you for Jesus today. And Father, we thank you that we can be set free from pain and the memory of it and knowing that it's just a second. Heavenly Father, we love you today and we worship you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen and Amen and Amen. Well, be sure to give everybody a big squeeze before you go and we will see you back next week and bring some folks with you next Sunday. God bless you.